Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Conversations with uh, McGill Office for Science and Society, COVID-19 plus more. Uh, joining me today, my colleagues, Emily Shore, Jonathan Jerry, and uh, a very special guest, Dr. John Brownstein, who's a professor of medicine at Harvard University. He's also the chief innovation officer at Children's Hospital in Boston. And uh, most importantly, he's a McGill graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, having done his undergraduate degree in biology here at McGill, and then a PhD in epidemiology at Yale University. Uh, after that, he is one of the youngest ever professors uh, at, uh, at Harvard as a full professor uh, in Harvard Medical School. And in 2010, he received the Presidential Early Career Award. And this is an award given to uh, young researchers who are especially adept at what they do. And that, that is a big deal. So congratulations on, uh, on that, John. I mean, that's really quite an achievement, uh, being as young as you are, full professor at Harvard and having got the presidential award. And uh, um, obviously in epidemiology, you have looked at many things. I know you looked at Lyme disease, looked at Ebola, cholera, but uh, I guess, unfortunately, since uh, last March or so, your life has been taken over by uh, mm -hmm. COVID-19 and as has, of course, uh, all of our lives. So uh, as uh, we get going here, uh, perhaps you could just give us a very quick rundown on what epidemiology is, mm -hmm. uh, what epidemiologists do, yeah. and especially your particular area, which is computational epidemiology, how sure. that differs from standard epidemiology. Yeah, no, it's great. And thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. Um, so yeah, I've been uh, working in this field of epidemiology for a couple decades, and mostly uh, it's been challenging to explain to people what I do. I think maybe it has something to do with studying uh, skin disease uh, or something, but you know, the epidemiologist was sort of this unknown job function probably until the last few months where now you know, most of uh, the country is trying to be an armchair epidemiologist, trying to understand data and a pandemic. And you know, Essentially, it's all about understanding, you know, disease in, in person, time, place, and, and understanding disease at a population level. So most of the studies that we see that tell us like, you know, this, this you know, activity is good for you or your diet change, you know, changing your diet helps you improve your life. You know, these sort of broad population level uh, efforts are sort of all about what epidemiology is, trying to understand disease in populations trying to understand the risk factors that contribute to disease and trying to study sort of the interventions that allow you to understand if something works, right? So whether it's understanding a drug or a lifestyle change, all of that is based on the sort of field of epidemiology. And, you know, there's a wide range of, of, of areas, chronic disease, right? Environmental health, my area is infectious disease, but it, it encompasses a wide, wide range uh, of sort of academic disciplines and statistical analyses. So when you hear about you know, studies like clinical trials or observational studies, all the kinds of studies that people are picking apart right now when they're trying to understand whether a drug is working or understand who is vulnerable in the population when it comes to a particular, or to COVID specifically, you know, this is all sort of epidemiologists that are working hard to understand that. Um, computational epidemiology is, is sort of a newer field um, that has sort of arisen in the last decade and that's really because of the rise of big data, um, the, the ability for us to access huge, large data sets um, to understand, to mine those information sources, to get insights about disease and populations. And so a lot of my work is working with major companies like Google or Twitter or Facebook that have the world's largest data sets where people go to and talk about their health conditions or interact with them in the ways that could give you insights into disease. Um, we mine that information to get insight. And so as you hear about sort of AI and machine learning in healthcare, um, those are sort of the computational methods that we're applying to these large data sets to get sort of these deep sort of insights into um, our health and what can make us better. Obviously, one of the critical features of epidemiology is, is how the disease spreads. Mm -hmm. And this, this is uh, uh, so important to try to understand what is going on now. I mean, of course, we're all cognizant of the fact that you sneeze on someone, you cough on someone. Yeah, you're likely to, to get this. But, but, run away. 
Yeah, but there are a large number of cases where uh, I think it's a mystery on how people got it. There was a, just a fascinating article in the New Yorker uh, that this discussed this. Uh, you know, a couple of people who had absolutely no idea. They had done everything, masks, isolated themselves, and, and yet they came down, down with it. So, so John, to, to uh, give us a sort of a, a simple view on exactly how you think this is, is spreading and what may account for those cases that right now seem to have no explanation. Right. Well, I mean, there, there's multiple reasons why um, this virus spreads, and sometimes it's spread in ways that we have not been able to predict. Um, in some ways, this virus is actually the perfect virus. I was involved in advising the movie A Contagion, which now many people have finally seen. And when we started to pull together the features of what a perfect virus would, that would bring sort of the world to its knees and make a really good movie, it was very similar to, to COVID-19, amazingly enough. And so, uh, you know, this is a disease that causes a wide range of symptoms, very hard to define, right? So it could be cough or shortness of breath, but also it, it, it can um, produce sort of asymptomatic infection, meaning that you can be infected and not display symptoms for days. In fact, you may not display uh, symptoms ever. And so with that in mind, that's a very efficient virus that can spread globally without, you know, without, you know, being hindered by sort of major interventions like say temperature scanning, because not everybody gets a fever when they get this virus. So you may be infected by someone and not even realize it. And you may not ever know that they were positive for the virus. And that makes a perfect situation for a pandemic where you have this disease that can spread efficiently and nobody sees it. As a counterexample, Ebola um, that produces very, very specific, or very severe symptoms, which means that as much as it causes higher numbers of deaths, you can control it much more easily. With COVID-19, yes, you know, people talk about fatality and, and like, oh, it's not that serious. Well, if, if a virus can spread this efficiently across an entire globe, it's going to cause more deaths than any of those more severe viruses. So there's that factor. And then there's the interventions. I mean, mask wearing isn't perfect, you know, especially depending on the mask that people use, uh, if people aren't washing their hands effectively. I mean, there are all of these interventions that we're trying to push, social distancing as an example, they all have uh, an impact, but they're not perfect. And as we learn more about this virus, we keep getting more and more data points about what masks are appropriate. How far should you be from someone? What is your risk of getting the virus off the surface? So you know, we're doing the research in real time off of, of a novel virus that nobody has ever known before. And that makes it incredibly challenging. And probably for the general public makes it really challenging, uh, especially because you're just constantly hearing new data points, new guidelines, shifting policy, and it's very hard to absorb all of that. Well, you just mentioned about uh, possibility of infection by touching a, a surface. And this is something that, that we've dealt with before and a lot of questions come up ab uh, about this. And... Um, uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, there are these people who, who just don't know how they got it because yeah. they didn't have any contact with uh, personal contact with people, etc. And maybe they got it by touching something. But but I know to me this is such a uh, unlikely yeah. uh, scenario because you you'd have to have active virus on the surface, mm -hmm. and you'd have to touch that, touch your face. And, I mean, it's. I, I agree with you. I, I think that the, that transmission route uh, of surface base is on the, the much lower end. Um, it's hard to study clearly in the real world because people are not necessarily isolated in controlled settings. And so it's very hard to understand the mode of transmission. But I would agree that that's low. And I think in general, that's why public health has not been as you know, sort of as hard in advocating for, for surfaces because it just becomes untenable for the population to be so hyper fixated on every element that they need right. to do. And so that's why public health has been, if you can wear a mask, socially distant, um, wash your hands. I mean, that becomes the most of what you can ask of someone, especially to do this over months, if not, you know, a year from now. So yeah, versus back in March and April, I guess, where we were really trying to like cover all bases. Mm -hmm. It was the socially distancing and the wash, you know, wiping down groceries and all the surfaces. I guess now we're focusing more on- Well, on the it's one. become a marathon, not a sprint. And so you need to think about sustainable uh, interventions, not things that, you know, people will get tired of. And as we've experienced in the US, the fatigue around this pandemic is real. 
the pushback on mask wearing, and that's when you get the major flare-ups. And we've seen that across the Sun Belt in the U.S. Now you've looked at the spread around the world, and you know you've got this in the graphic, which is is very interesting here. So if if you can you know describe a little bit about what you know about how it has spread around the world, where the hot areas are. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, we uh, build technology, you know, sort of our computational efforts that is hyper-focused on identifying the early signs, clues of a virus in a population. And so um, I guess if you put up the graphic now, I mean, essentially our system is called Health Map. It's globally tracking for every possible emerging infectious disease around the globe. The idea is that um, you can essentially identify an outbreak and then push that information to organizations like the WHO and CDC. Um, on top of that, we're collecting data through you know, mining of local news and uh, social media um, and public health agencies to basically build a view of an emerging disease in real time that is really challenging to do by any one sort of global health agency. And um, so we detected actually the first signs publicly of the virus in, in sort of late December, December 30th, through sort of actually a Chinese news media outlet talking about this mysterious illness uh, that was causing the pneumonia in a small number of people that had um, a connection to the Wuhan seafood market. Um, and then from there, you know, into January, we started seeing the spread uh, in China. And then clearly, you know, from there really started to take off where we saw, you know, pockets like in, in Italy start to light up and across Europe. Um, and what we saw ensue was a really sort of different uh, experience country by country, right? Some countries took the events incredibly seriously. Taiwan, as an example, Singapore, Iceland, many of those and New Zealand, as an example, um, many of those are island countries, so they, they had an ability to sort of lock down their borders and really intervene in, in really some both uh, high tech ways and low tech ways, you know, high tech ways using technology to trace contacts, but also low tech mass mandates. Then you have other countries and I'll just say, you know, the country I live in now, the US, which didn't take signs that seriously and, and um, didn't beef up their both their testing capacity and their sort of response and sort of made it feel like this was another, this is a part of an issue in other part of the globe that we didn't have to consider. Um, and that turned into basically the worst epicenter uh, for, of COVID in, around the globe. And, you know, we're about, you know, 166 deaths, uh, 166,000 deaths in, in the US and growing model projections have it the next month over 200,000 um, millions of cases. Um, and, you know, amazingly enough, we're either still in the first wave or already in a second wave. And so it's, it's quite interesting to see the differences in the experience that, you know, have happened around the globe. And we can study that based on the data we're collecting. Of course, because all, all of the terrible consequences, a lot of attention now, of course, is being focused on vaccines. Yeah. And a lot of eggs are being put into that, that basket. Yeah. And, uh, of course, it became even more complicated the other day when uh, uh, President Putin of Russia said that they have a vaccine. Yeah. And I know Jonathan uh, has been following the vaccine story, you know, for a long time. So maybe, Jonathan, you want to come in at this point and, and uh, you know, mention what you think about the Russian vaccine. And then John will comment on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what, what else there is to say, but I mean, essentially, uh, Putin and his health authority have already approved uh, this vaccine that has not undergone phase three clinical trial. And, and hopefully, uh, uh, you know, Professor uh, uh, Brownstein can, can explain what, what, what this means, but uh, they have done these very early human studies. The results are still not available. They have not done the bigger studies uh, that are necessary to to indeed show safety and to to um, report back on on sort of rarer side effects, but also to show that it does confer immunity to the disease. So, I mean, it has been described as essentially propaganda um, and and as a way of as a sort of a new arms race between the U.S. and and, and Russia. Um, and it's and as as uh, as, as Dr. Brownstein uh, mentioned earlier it will probably have an effect on vaccine hesitancy uh, because if we do hear, if they do start to use this vaccine um, and there are some serious side effects 
and we hear about this through the trickle of, of social media, then the public in general might become uh, very skeptical of any COVID vaccine, no matter how well researched it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's been a lot of focus on the approval process for vaccines and understanding what goes in to that approval process. Uh, Russia is essentially skipping the phase three uh, steps, right? They've looked at, you know, small safety studies and a small number of people and have seen some level of immune response to the vaccine. But if you really want to get through an approval of vaccine, you have to look at the, its use in tens of thousands of people at least because you need to see, A, whether it works in the real world um, and it's effective because nobody wants an, a vaccine that doesn't confer real immunity. And also you want to see that there's no side effects in a broad set of the population. And that's especially vulnerable populations, the young and the old. Those initial studies don't include those kinds of individuals. Um, and those are the ones that are going to be you know high priority for the vaccine in itself. So you've now skipped over a process, you have a real risk of a failure. We may never even know that, but then it applies political pressure in the US to, to try to sidestep the, the approval process. And then you have a major issue on your hands because right now in this country, uh, in the US, and I'm sure it's similar in Canada, you, you don't even have half the population that would take the COVID vaccine if it was available even through the traditional approval process. And so, if we are looking uh, to get herd immunity, and I know you know that was a concept that not a lot of people talked about until now, which is having enough of the population immunized either through natural infection or the vaccine to slow the spread and stop the spread of the virus. If you can't get herd immunity through immunization, then it becomes a real problem because you just have an unsuccessful vaccine. And so much of our work is on this sort of vaccine hesitancy issue where there's such already a mistrust of government agencies, of pharma, you add in this Russian uh, component and you really have a disaster on your hands. Well, let's focus for a moment on, on the US and the vaccine development, which uh, President Trump says is imminent, that we're going to have a vaccine you know, with, with a few months. Dr. Fauci is of course uh, much more reserved uh, about that. So what do you think? What, what is the path towards a, a safe and effective vaccine in the U.S.? And what do you think is the real timeline? Yeah, so I, you know, I think that the reasonable timeline, if all goes well, is that you know, early into next year, we will have a vaccine that can be deployed. We have enough candidates out there that are now in this phase three effort, Moderna being one example, but we have also a vaccine that's being tested here at Boston Children's that is looking promising. Um, and what's you know, great is that the, the US government is investing in the sort of manufacturing of these vaccines in parallel to the process of studying these vaccines. So it's not stepwise, uh, so that's good, but it really depends on how fast these phase three results can get uh, identified because the, the situ how you prove the efficacy of a vaccine is you need to deploy this vaccine in places that are hotspots and people potentially could be infected. And then you start to look and see, okay, well, this person had the vaccine. Did they have an infection that we could detect it, the, compared to the population that didn't get the vaccine? And if that's a detectable difference and you can estimate the efficacy of that vaccine and then, that is, and then on top of that with the safety profile that are generated from the people that got it, then that goes to the FDA um, and that you know, gets the approval. But again, there's a lot of sort of ifs in this process that make it you know, concerning. And, and again, you know, this is why Dr. Fauci has been trying to be realistic because as much as we want to be enthusiastic about the amount of innovation and the, and the pipeline of these vaccines, um, this could, it could also not work. And in which case we are still left with our sort of basic public health measures that we have to keep focusing on. I think the, the fact that the vaccine may be deployed by early next year, that's certainly possible, hopefully based on proper phase three trials. But the fact is that even then, we really won't know what is happening in the population at large until a later date, right? It's really the phase four that, that really gives you the, the clear information about yeah. what, what, is, what oh. is going on. So I, I, I think that, you know, the optimism that is being, you know, uh, expressed now about the, the sort of a vaccine solution to this by next year is, is too optimistic. Yeah. It's, you know, again, we all want to believe and, you know, clearly everyone is absolutely drained. Um, and even the people that have been spending their whole life studying infectious diseases like me are completely drained by this. 
Um, and so everyone wants to believe it can be done, but I think the expectations are, are quite high, higher than the reality. Yeah, something else that, that is now, now emerging is uh, the possibility of using hypochlorous acid sprays, yeah. you know, and, you know, we've seen these pictures in China where people are walking through these tunnels and, and are being sprayed and, and uh, you know, there, there are these scenarios where if sporting events open up or theaters open up, the same way that we walk through metal detectors, we'll walk through these, uh, these sprays. Now, but but again, this is predicated on, on on the possibility that that touching things is is such an important conveyance, right? Uh, so I I think that this is is going to give a degree of false confidence to people. I, I agree. I mean, there's there's things that you do for the optics of of trying to, you know create environments that are disinfected. But the reality is because we know that asymptomatic transmission uh, through droplets, um, potentially aerosols, but you know, mostly respiratory droplets is the main sort of mode. All these other things are extra. Um, and I agree, creates a false sense of protection. I mean, they're talking about you know, opening up certain types of sporting events into the fall. I, I'd be very concerned, again, if we have active community transmission, I think it'd be very hard to do these things safely, especially uh, in, you know, when you, you put sort of vulnerable populations together, probably, uh, probably a lot of alcohol involved, a lot of shouting and screaming, uh, which we know is a big mode of transmission. Those are recipes for, you know, disaster. And so it, as much as, you know, I'm a huge New England Patriots fan and want to go to the game, I just don't think this fall is going gonna, is gonna to be sort of the setting to do so. Right. Well, the NFL so far has not said that they will play with no spectators, right? They're still, they're well, still saying the, that they may the have- Dallas Cowboys have said that they plan to open with fans. So that, that's, that was a statement made yesterday, but we'll see really? if they can actually, uh, they can actually do that. So that, is, that is kind of uh, frightening. Yeah. So what if people would make the same parallel with what you just said with sports teams and spectators in schools? Yeah. Now, you know, I know the number of people are still different, yeah. but not the closeness of them and the shouting in elementary schools yeah. and everything. That's a great point. Now, I would say to the schools and sporting events, one is necessary, the other is not, right? So we have to prioritize as a society what we're going to focus on uh, as a priority for opening. And I, I, would, I would hope most of us would say that school uh, in-person learning provides a huge amount of benefit to kids and is far outweighs any uh, need for sporting events or bars or clubs or any of these other events that can that are conducive to transmission. So if we if we prioritize schools and we recognize that schools are important and we know that kids potentially are not um, as susceptible or maybe not get as sick, though that's still, you know, still a lot of work needs to be done, then you think, okay, well now you can open you should target opening schools as the priority for the fall. How do you do that really depends on a couple factors. One, do you have a lot of community transmission, right? So in Georgia, as an example, where we're seeing these, you know, these schools closing and active cases and, and you can't open schools if you have sort of an out of control outbreak. It just can't happen because kids will serve as vectors. And then you have the staff and teachers that are completely vulnerable. It's just, it's not correct. But say you have community transmission down, then, okay, how do you open schools? Well, can you mandate some level of social distancing? Can you cluster classrooms or grades? Can you encourage or, or mandate mask wearing, which I know is painful? Can you have some level of outdoor schooling? Can you improve the ventilation in these places? If you can start to do all those things, and that is a huge burden on schools. I mean, I'm not trying to minimize that huge burden, but if you can start to do some of those things, then, the, and then, and to your point, maybe you, you don't have, uh, you know, singing lessons and public speaking and things that are, you know, we know generate a lot of uh, respiratory uh, droplets, then I think you're, you're, in, you're in a position where schools should and, and can reopen. Let's get to the masks, because, I mean, this has become so controversial, so politicized. I mean, you know, it's, it's really just amazing that that, that has happened. And, uh, you know, I've uh, certainly on my Facebook page, I've talked a lot about the importance of wearing masks, which, of course, brings all kinds of yeah. people out of the woodwork, you know, and challenge me on. All right. Prove it. Where are the controlled trials to show that wearing masks works? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, there are, there have been studies that have shown that masks, you know, like actual laboratory studies where you have masks and you try different masks out and they show that they have direct control over the spray of respiratory droplets. I mean, clearly we've seen this and not all masks are created equal. Uh, we know that things like bandanas that are more porous are not as effective as a N95 mask and there's a wide range, um, but we know that something is better than nothing. Um, and we've been doing population level studies on mask wearing. So how do you look at a, a, a po populations across say the US who have up to, where mask uptake is different. And then you look at the ensuing uh, epidemics in those locations. And what we find, it's hard to study and it's hard to do properly because there's so many confounding factors, but we find that the more mask wearing you have in a population, uh, the better the controlled uh, ep epidemic is. And this is after controlling for social distancing and population density and other features. And so if you can get mask wearing to 50% or greater, you have a much better chance of controlling it. And we've seen this. What's interesting is that we've looked at mask mandates. Um, those aren't as effective. So we looked at you know what happens before and after a mask mandate. It turns out that mask mandates don't really change people's minds that much. Either you're wearing a mask, you don't. Um, and there's that point effect of, of saying the government enforcing it. it, it doesn't do actually as much as you'd expect. Um, but if you have a sizable part of the population doing this, it's very similar to a, a vaccine, right? Like you don't technically need everyone where having, getting the vaccine, you just need a critical mass of people getting the vaccine and then you can, you can have direct impact on the virus. Now, should everyone? Yes, because you're doing you're you're doing a service for your for your community by wearing it, uh, just like you are by not smoking indoors. I mean, it's like any other public mandate. You're doing something to protect others, and it's a it's it's not a huge burden to ask of people. And so, this has been a big debate in the U.S. Clearly, where we see communities pushing back and and parties and people you know trying to fly in the face of these mandates, but. Um, we ha there's there's great data that 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 shows today that the masks do provide. Are there specific uh, places in the U.S. where it is now clear that increase in mask wearing has led to reduction in incidence? Yeah. So in California, which you know has had you know its ups and downs, we've seen certain counties that have adopted mask wearing, and from that they've been able to have direct impact on the epidemic. I mean, here in, in Boston, Massachusetts. We have, you know, incredible uh, use of mask usage, and we've been able to keep the transmission quite low. I mean, it's it's up and down clearly, um, but yeah, I mean, there's great examples around around the country of this. You know, one question that comes up repeatedly is: is people kind of understand that yes, you wear a mask, you're pr uh, protecting others, but there are people who say, well, you know. What about me? How, how is it possible that that this wearing this mask protects others and doesn't do anything for me? Well, yeah, I mean, you're trying to do onto yourself as others would 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 do onto you. Um, but there's still good data to suggest that um, that the mask does protect you as well. It's not you're not just doing it for others. Um, wearing a mask does protect you to a certain extent, but the main objective clearly is. Uh, you're trying to, to protect your community. And as I said, you know, asymptomatic transmission is such an important part of this virus, right? So you're walking around, you likely could be a carrier and you don't even know it. So are you willing to do what's right to protect your community, to protect your, you know, elderly, uh, elderly relatives, um, your vulnerable, you know, household members? I mean, the question is like, what, what are people willing to do you know, if not for the community, then then at least for their loved ones. What do you think has caused this, the strong anti-mask movement in the US? And to some extent here too, although not quite as uh, as much. Um, I think it's a couple things. It's one is the government can't tell me what to do, um, you know, and, and there's a very big pushback, very similar. And there's overlap uh, between, uh, you know, those who, who think that you have the right to bear any type of arm um, and 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 not have to wear a mask. There's a there's strong overlap. We have done studies on mask wearing preference, and I'm not sure if you can guess, but there's a difference in mask wearing among Democrats and Republicans. I'll let you figure out which which of those groups is pushing back on mask wearing. Um, but you know, there's political affiliation associated to 
uh, a ma wearing a mask. Um, and so there's that. And then there's the people that just feel like they just don't buy into science. I mean, there is a strong anti-science movement uh, in the US and I, I'm sure at least it trickles into at least a bit in Canada and people just don't buy it. They don't buy that coronavirus is a, is a big deal. They don't, they think it's not as bad as, as a flu. They, they just don't, they, they can't absorb that this is a deal and the government and scientists are sort of in some form of agreement that they're going to push this crisis as and and use this as a way to to, to get out our current president. So you know that huh. that is definitely a, a theory that is you know is out there and is pushing people to not want to follow science and and sort of basic guidelines, which to me and probably to many people watching here seem incredibly obvious. And of course, there's the quote theory that this is a man-made virus that was released by the Chinese yes. either accidentally or, or on purpose, yeah. which I think has been totally dismissed by looking at the uh, genetics of the virus. So, you know, the, our viewpoint on this is that um, it's very unlikely that it came out of a lab. We have uh, close collaborators who work with that Wuhan facility um, and there's strong evidence that suggests that this was a virus that came out of a bat population, maybe through a pangolin and via the wildlife trade. Um, and there's great evidence that this virus was like basically like every other virus, right? Coronaviruses that we've seen like SARS and MERS, they've all sort of come out of animal populations. This is, you know, it's, I know it's hard for people to believe, but you know, every one of these major disease events that we've had, whether it's Zika or Ebola or West Nile virus, Lyme disease, every one, has a zone, it comes out of what we call zoonotic source, right? So there's a cycle in an animal population. And because we, uh, as a society, encroach into particular uh, parts of this globe where those viruses are, or we, you know, we, we trade animals illegally, we poach animals, we, you know, what all the reasons why we push for conservation are the same reasons why we push to like slow the spread of disease because these are where the viruses exist. Yeah. Um, and so that is the majority of scientists believe that this was a virus that spilled over like, you know, every other virus we've seen historically. Of course, PETA, the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, has jumped on this bandwagon, yeah. claiming, of course, that if we just would stick to a vegan diet, then we wouldn't have to deal with these kind of yeah. problems. Well, I mean, that's par probably partly true, though. Uh, we also know that it's all also about conservation. I mean encroaching into lands that, you know, where animals have not been necessarily in direct contact with humans uh, creates opportunities for, for jumping over of, of viruses into animal populations. And we've been involved for decades now in work to track these viruses at sources. Um, amazingly enough, I mean, I was part of a, a project funded by the US government for several years, which is all about finding novel coronaviruses in animal populations that program was defunded by the Trump administration last year. So timing of a, of a coronavirus hunter project that, you know, might've identified this, which was defunded, um, isn't, isn't lost on me. You had some controversy over one of your uh, studies, the yeah. satellite image uh, study. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this was one where, um, you know, we applied methods that we've used historically um, and didn't necessarily quite realized, I mean, I guess we understood the politicization of research, and the weaponization of science right now, but we didn't fully comprehend the extent of what could happen. So my work is really focused on early identification of outbreaks and populations and using whatever technology that you can identify to find those, those sort of signs. One of those examples, and actually it was work initially funded by the CIA, which was work to use satellite images to track um, a hospital parking lot. So the idea that we had is actually very similar to what is done um, in, by hedge funds to track economic activity, where you use a satellite to then look at how many cars are, say, in a parking lot of a Walmart, and you can say how well how well the economy is doing. Um, we use that to then look at open air parking lots of hospitals and to understand whether you could see. Um, spikes in the use of these hospitals just by counting the cars in the parking lots. And so we did this historically for flu to, to, with, um, to do this in Latin America where we could predict a flu season just by how busy a hospital was. And so we applied those methods 
to Wuhan thinking, oh, wow, you know, we still don't fully understand how this virus evolved. There's not a lot of good data. There's not a ton of data sharing, but we actually have satellites and those are out there. And for the satellites that we can access, because there are many satellites that are not accessible to people outside China, there are satellites constantly positioned taking images daily of Wuhan. And we could capture the numbers of cars in the parking lots in Wuhan over several years and see whether we saw a signal. And what we found was starting in October, we started seeing increase in busyness of hospitals. We try to adjust for things like whether there any major event happening, could we, you know, adjusting for like new constructions or whatever we could identify as a potential sort of bias in the data. And after doing that, we see sort of this rise in the use of hospitalizations. And this was early in the fall, which was, you know, earlier than the time frame that we knew about this virus, which happened when we only found out about it at the end of December. So, so that we, we published that, we put that out there and we thought in our view, this was just, you know, hey, you know, provides an additional piece of evidence to the story that we're still trying to compile. We also had our colleagues in China saying that the Wuhan seafood market was just an innocent bystander for this pandemic. Um, there were other people talking about the genomics uh, of the virus and that they, it probably spread from another province in China. But what ended up happening is that it, this, this paper got a lot of press and then ended up on Fox News. And then Fox News had a very uh, political view of the paper, which was China wasn't telling the truth. And then the thing that no scientist, I promise you, as much as it sounds like it get all publicity is good publicity, I'm telling you, this is no scientist ever wants to be tweeted by Donald Trump. Um, and that happened by to me. And then from there, clearly, you know, did you receive the, did you receive a direct tweet? Uh, it was well, he was tweeting about my the paper. But you're, uh, so right. everybody knew. Uh, so yes, no, he didn't retweet me, but he retweeted the Fox News interpretation of my study, which was yeah. even worse because it right. it was very much in the in the vein of you know this har this Harvard group uncovered the lies of China, which was oh. not our intention ever. And so you get the tweet, and then you know you never have a full understanding of the scale of of bots online until something like that happens. And then the, the, the hate bots come in, the, the, the people questioning you. And so it just, it snowballed. And you would think something like that would end in, in you know, every people were telling me, oh, a new story ends in, in 48 hours. Don't worry about it. Weeks, <laughs> weeks and weeks and weeks of emails and, and tweets. And so anyways, it finally died down and we can sort of look at it and and think about that as a, a wild experience, one more of these wild experiences during this pandemic, but that is definitely not one I would, uh, I would suggest for were, any. Were there any personal threats? There were, um, I had colleagues of mine, one who's Chinese, so she, her family in China was threatened. Um, another colleague who's African-American and she was getting uh, racial threats. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was all the authors of the paper were sort of getting targeted in, in different unique ways. Um, so, you know, it really, it spells out, you know, the time that we live in where, you know, science gets put into a, a different frame than you sort of ever expect, right. which is sort of this, you know, you had, a, it, you put this out there because you had a political view and you had an ax to grind and, you know, that was the sort of the reasoning for doing it. Even though our, our paper itself was, was very measured, it got interpreted in a way uh, that wasn't. And, and you know, weaponization- That's very concerning to, to anyone who communicates science these days. And Jonathan can certainly comment on this because uh, we had an issue this past week where someone was threatening us uh, with a lawsuit for a totally ridiculous reason where uh, there was a, a, a Innocent comment made in an interview, Jonathan. Maybe you want to just elaborate on on that. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm allowed to elaborate about this, but but all I will say is that yes, yeah, sometimes you'll say something in the media uh, that has nothing to do uh, with a, spe a specific individual or a specific organization, but because that organization or individual gets mentioned by the journalist in the the article itself, you end up getting part of a of a of, of a legal threat essentially. Um, but uh, but but sort of tangential to that, I, I was wondering you because you do a lot of interviews uh, with major uh, American media platforms. And I was curious to know, like, what is your impression of how the American media has covered this pandemic? Yeah. 
And, and how do you deal also with you know, the soundbite, the fact that you have these brief appearances on, on television or even in the written media, but you have to talk, to talk about these very complex and nuanced uh, subjects? It's hard. And I think it is really, um, it's, it, it's, you, you have to perfect science communication. I mean, that is such a big part of this. I've, I, I've been lucky enough to um, develop a relationship with ABC News and they put a huge amount of effort into, you know, vetting science into science communication. Um, even if maybe I get a soundbite in the background, we're ha helping vet uh, the stories of what goes on, what, what doesn't go on. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's still a challenge, right? I mean, you were trying, there's a fatigue too of, of saying some of the same things over and over and over again. Um, I would say generally, I mean, I've been, you know, part of the issue is that health reporting um, is, is, has been sort of a, a, a component of news that just keeps shrinking. I mean, there's just, there's been, there are very few health reporters out there. So I just put a challenge of this pandemic where all the news is health and you're taking, pulling people off of news desks and White House coverage and other things, and they're forcing them to cover sort of important public health topics with no expertise. So luckily, a lot of my colleagues have been pulled in to many of these conversations. And I mean, that some of them have gone some serious, you know, Twitter stardom out of their science communication. So it's definitely, um, there's definitely been a, a huge number of people that have stepped up, partly because at least here in the US, there's been a void created in science communication. Um, the lack of, you know, we have the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, that has been completely sidelined. You know, they've had very little sort of in front science communication. And then you have these sort of White House briefings um, that, you know, you're just, you're just completely stunned by the things that, that go on in some of these discussions where you're talking about, you know, drinking uh, disinfectant or shining lights up into different parts of your body to, to control. The, I mean, you never know what you're gonna expect. And so you get one of those and then it's like, a race to figure out how to explain or, you know, you know, there, there's data that's presented and manipulated in a way that is not actually correct. And so it's been a nonstop sort of effort to tr control the message. Well, the hydroxychloroquine issue is, is a classic one of that. And he keeps coming back to it, which is, is, is just so bizarre. Yeah, it's, it's, it is bizarre. And you wonder, whether there's potential conflicts of interest at play that we don't know about or because it doesn't even, or it's just a matter of, of being stubborn um, and just not wanting to drop it, but the science doesn't support it. There, there just, it, there isn't the back, the, the data um, to, to sort of recommend it. And so, but somehow we keep, um, we keep getting pulled in to this discussion of this one particular drug where we should be devoting resources to thinking about other therapies. And so it's, it's, it really, uh, it's just taking up so much of our time to sort of counter this misinformation when, you know, we could be spending it, you know, in, in many other ways. Do you have, do you have any insight on how to start the depolarization and the depoliticization of these scientific issues in the U S especially because what I'm seeing is this increased polarization over anything really um, I know that this is a really tough question to sort of even, even tackle, but do you have any insight as to how to bring this back down to, yeah. to what the scientific evidence has to say? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's challenging. I mean, I would say, you know, Dr. Fauci was that voice of reason, but I mean, he's also, you know, he's getting death threats, his family's getting death threats. So I, I, I don't have a great answer. I mean, is it a change of administration, potentially? Um, it's... It, I, I don't know. I, I, it makes me very concerned because I, I don't see necessarily a path. You know, everybody's very locked in on their perspective. Um, and I don't, you know, it's not going to be a scientist that's going to help sort of unify things. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know if there's a major change in industry. I, but yeah, it's it, science communication is as tough as it's ever been. And, and you know, if we drill it even into this vaccine hesitancy question, it's, you know, the people that are anti-vaccine are going to remain anti-vaccine. It's going to be very hard to convince anybody uh, to get off of their position, no matter what the science says. I think my, my experience in, in interacting with the public over 40 years now is that you can divide the public into three categories. There are those who are very knowledgeable, who read a lot and of scientific yeah. background, 
you don't have to worry about them because they'll make the right decision. Then you have the other tail end of the of the bell curve. These are the dedicated anti-vax people, the anti-mask people, and you know the creationists. And no matter what you say, you're not going to change them. Well, it's like a religion, pretty much. Yes. Yeah. And then you have a very significant segment of the population in the middle of the bell curve who are legitimately confused because these are confusing times, right? We, we get badgered with information from, from both sides all the time. Uh, a lot of it sounds very credible and it's, you know, it's hard to know what to make of it. And these are the people who I think can be convinced yeah. uh, because, you know, they, they are, uh, legitimately interested but but admit to being confused because some of the anti-information sounds so credible so i think that's what we have to concentrate on i I, I don't think that there's much point in trying to convert the the dedicated anti-vaxxers we're just not going to be successful there yeah i agree yeah i mean sorry go ahead no no you go ahead i was gonna say yeah i mean we tend to think that the sort of extreme voices on the internet are the majority. So as you say, Joe, like it's, it's it, the loudest voices aren't necessarily representing the most people. They just happen to get the most attention because they have the extreme attitudes. And I agree. Like, I think we, we have to stop focusing on yeah. that minority that happens to shut. Of course, we have a real problem when one of those extreme voices happens to be the president of the U S that is a problem. But yeah. that middle, that middle uh, population that we can really do well with, that's where, a good administration and you know good guidance and role models and science communicators that's why they're so important right now so yeah. but john getting back for just for a second to, to china yeah. uh what about the way that they really did release the information i mean is there any reason to believe that they weren't honest that's a hard thing to comment on. You know, I'd like to believe that it's a broad issue of underfunding public health, um, you know, globally. So if a virus like this showed up in the US, a virus that looks like many other things, we don't have real adequate testing, would we have missed it for months? I, I actually think that's possible. You know, like I don't think it would have been about misinformation. I think it would just been lack of capability to identify a novel virus. And so I'm going by that theory for now, which is, it's the, you know, this COVID is very much like many other illnesses. It would be hard to have seen it. Um, and it could have gone months without being detected. Now, you know, I think there's also, I think a deeper investigation needs to be done. I think WHO as a group that's gone there and is trying to uncover who knew what, when, and what was missing. And so was it an information freedom issue or was it just a, a lack of public health capacity? Um, but regardless, I mean, it does point to the fact that we need better resourcing on the global scale in emerging infectious diseases. I mean, this is one event that we've experienced, but it's not going to be the last, unfortunately. I mean, we've always thought that that this event was going to be a bad flu, right? Like we just always, that was the prediction among most epidemiologists is that a, 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 chain, a mutation in a particular uh, flu virus uh, may result in what we're seeing today. Um, that's still a prediction that hasn't changed. Um, and, you know, so there's still that major threat that is out there. And the question is, what are we going to do at a global scale to invest in preparedness and surveillance um, and response in a way that's serious um, and the way that's been underfunded for the you know last you know, 20 years? Interestingly enough, I just saw a news item of China refusing a shipment of chicken wings from Brazil because they detected remnants of the virus uh, of avian flu or yeah yeah now this business of you know detecting the virus is also confusing to a lot of people detecting viruses on surfaces etc and you know contamination is as i understand it what they actually look for are pieces of rna of of the virus Mm -hmm. which doesn't mean that there's active virus on there Exactly. Uh, and so there's a lot of panic that is being created when, you know, someone comes out with some discourse that, that the virus was, quote, detected on a surface. Very confusing. I mean, the reality is you can detect samples of a virus in many places, um, but it doesn't mean that there is active virus that and, and that there's enough to actually create a transmission event. And that's a very those are two very different things. I mean, that's that's where the there's many components of this that are problematic. I mean, 
antibody, you know, and then, then just generally testing has created a lot of confusion, right? Because there's antibody testing, antigen testing, PCR. These are all terms that people keep hearing. There's not a lot of understanding of what this means, right? So if you test for antibodies, it means you may have had some exposure. It doesn't mean you have active infection, but it also doesn't mean you're necessarily immune. Um, um, sorry. Um, so yeah, the calling or? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I guess I've said something wrong on this call. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean anything, you know, these tests. So that's why there's a lot of confusing, confusion about what kind of tests you should get and what they mean and how they're used. You know, some are used much for population surveillance. Some are used more for, for decision processes. Um, so, yeah, so it's, um, um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's a, a lot of challenge out there. Can I ask a question? Uh, Joe, you asked or you said that sometimes there's the RNA, the inactive virus on surfaces, and I'm the non-scientist, so I'm bringing it from the lay people. What about the aerosol transmission? Has there ever been shown that, you know, there's some just of the RNA or the inactive virus there? I mean, we have a question on Facebook actually that, that also says or asks, yeah. how long can um, a, the virus live, like the aerosol particles live in indoor space? Yeah, yeah. And what if it's just RNA and not active or? Right. Yeah. I mean, aerosol transmission is still something that uh, there's a lot of confusion around as well. This is this ability for the virus to stay in the air for some period of time. Um, this is why this conversation about ventilation in schools has become so critical, right? So this idea that um, you can take virus out of the air. Part of the other concern is some of that ventilation can actually force virus to sort of into these vortexes, which are actually could create transmission events, especially depending on the layout of the class, but the reality is, I mean, there's still so much still to learn about how important that that sort of mode is compared to sort of that more traditional respiratory droplet, I, I cough or sneeze on you type event. Yeah. Well, we're kind of coming to the end of our, a lot of time here. So John, let me finish off by asking you something that I like to ask all experts mm -hmm. uh, who, you know, spend their life looking into these problems. Yeah. What have you, personally done since you started to work on COVID-19? How has it changed your life? And, and yeah. what are you yourself doing? What are you careful with? What kind of testing have, have you had? Yeah, I mean... Do so you funny. wash your groceries, this kind <laughs> of thing? That's a good question. I mean, I've had a much more sort of uh, um, moderate view of these things. I think you could drive yourself crazy with the numbers of, of activities you could undertake on a daily basis to control the virus. I mean... Clearly, for the most part, I'm in my home office, very socially distant, but, you know, activities outside, running, physical activity, I mean, it's so important. So you can't sort of remove that from sort of your routine or else, you know, it, the mental health and physical health component is so important to maintain. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you know, re reducing mobility, reducing your numbers of contacts, like all those things. Um, I've gone a couple antibody tests more just for my own uh, interest rather than anything else and the negative. And so even though I was convinced like everyone else that I had something early on that was probably COVID, I found out it likely wasn't COVID. Um, so one of the many people that thought what we, what the symptoms I was carrying, um, but that's it. I mean, you know, trying to, you know, keep things, as uh, socially distant as possible heading into the school year so our kids have a good chance of, of heading back into physical learning. Would you have a couple of friends over for dinner inside? Uh, we've been doing outdoor dinners, outdoor outdoor settings, uh, you know, with some level of social distancing, but not not indoor. We haven't it's gonna done be really fun once winter comes along. Right, Boston exactly. Boston also isn't so fun in the I winter. Know, if, I, if I were to invest in anything, any any heat lamp companies yeah. out there, it's probably the worthwhile investment right now. I think there's. Oh, you can't you can't <laughs> find them. <laughs> it's too late. You yeah. can't buy them. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, but yeah, I, I think you know you 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 need you need to have social interaction. You can't sort of completely shut down. But you know if you can. Can do everyone has their own threshold of uh, how much they can do and you know if everyone does enough then that collective enough will will have a real impact um and then you know try to you know there, there's the unnecessary activities out there that we see on the news and those just become sort of irresponsible frankly i i see very little light at the end of this tunnel I, i'm not sure how we're that's encouraging yeah, yeah. <laughs> good way to end off yeah <laughs>
do, do you think that that light is going to get brighter? And I mean, what, what do you envision? How do you think this will peter out if it does? Uh, you know, it, that my attitude of this changes. I do think we have a good year uh, left, maybe hopefully a little less, especially with the vaccine on the horizon. I still think about the sort of major shifts in sort of how we live our lives more broadly as a result. You know, do people just go about their normal activities? Are they willing to go into to large crowds again? Do people want to ever go back to an office setting and cubicles close to other people? You know, I think there could be some fundamental shifts in our, you know daily living that are so happen regardless of whether this virus is around or not, because people are going to think about the sort of next threat that's out there. Um, but some of those changes are, you know, probably good for just, you know, people's lives to be able to work from home when they can have more flexibility. Um, but I, I guess I'm, I probably have a, a more positive outlook, uh, you know, after a year from now than maybe you do. Well, that has been a fascinating discussion. I, and I think we've, you know, shed some light on, on, uh, on some of these issues. And it's always great to, you know, hear from someone who basically yeah. spends their life looking yeah. into, into this situation. So, John, thanks very much for, for joining us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's a blast uh, to spend time with you. It's all, always nice to see a Montreal boy make good. <laughs> <laughs> and you certainly have, have done that. So we will um, hopefully check back with you sometime in the future yeah. when, when you become more clarified about the vaccine and uh, the political situation, which hopefully right. will change in, uh, in November. Thanks. So thanks a lot for uh, joining us. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks you. everyone. And uh, we will see you again. Uh, when, Emily? In two weeks. In two weeks time. Yeah. 12 o'clock. Look at our social media. And uh, for sure, uh, things will have changed by then because they seem to change day by day, if not hour by hour. So yeah. thanks very much for joining us. And we will see you in two weeks. In two weeks. Thank you.